So we're next going to hear from the Community Engagement in Genomics Working Group. And I've asked Carla Easter to introduce the uh, working group member, Gwen Darian, who will give the presentation. And uh, Carla is the education part of the Division of Policy, Communication, and Education. I have it. I have it. Yeah. We're, gonna leave, we're just going to leave this here. <laughs> Wonderful. So um, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Gwen Darian, who is the chair of our working group and, in fact, is the first chair of our Community Engagement and Genomics Working Group. Uh, but Gwen has a long history in engagement and working with uh, the Genome Institute, which she will talk a little bit about. Um, she is, as I said, a longtime patient advocate. She is currently the Executive Vice President for Patient Advocacy and Engagement at the National Patient Advocate Foundation um, and also a three-time cancer survivor. Um, and so it has been a wonderful uh, opportunity to work with her, and it is my pleasure to have her talk about uh, the working group and our activities over the last uh, year and a half, two years. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you, Carla. You're welcome. Um, thank you, Carla. And uh, okay, so the first thing I have to figure out is how to advance the slides. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I'm a little technologically challenged in, in terms of that. Anyway, thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Dr. Green. Thank you, members of council. Um, I actually had to uh, edit my presentation because I put we are the newest working group, but in fact, we are the second newest working group of the <laughs> of the council. Um, and I and I thought that it was really interesting that one of the things that Trey Eidecker finished with was this notion of community engagement. And I'm not sure whether our our ideas of community engagement are the same, but I think that. Um, we are going to pick up a little bit where Trey left off in terms of thinking about community engagement across very, very different stakeholders. And as everybody in this room knows, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, if um, you ha we have the science, we have the medicine, and then we have the community engagement. And it's, nothing's going to go anywhere unless the community is engaged in making sure that genomic and precision medicine is, um, is adopted by the community and also is equitable um, and available to everybody in this community. So we are, um, this is us, and I have to say I've never watched that show, but I love that title. This is us. Um, and we began as an ad hoc working group, which was the, called the Partnership for Community, I have to read that, Car Partnership for Community Engagement and Outreach, uh, Community Outreach and Engagement in Genomics in 2000, and in 2017, we became a working group of this council. And as you, um, as you can't tell from this, but you can tell the diversity of faces and expressions and engagement and um, I, you know, they're just, there's such different spirit in every single picture that's up here. We are, we include community leaders, we include liaisons, health, health advocates, community-based researchers, health practitioners, and patients and caregivers, and we represent very diverse populations from across the nation. Um, we are, of course, any group can't represent all communities, but as we transition in, in our membership, we will continue to try to make sure that voices are heard and also try to make sure that the people who come are, are not only representing their own voices, but also out there thinking and talking to everybody, to other people about what genomics means to them. Um, I, we have very, we are very different stakeholders, we have very different perspectives, and we have a very trusting and open relationship among this group. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that later. Um, the other thing that's really significant but st significant about this group, and uncommon for NIH, and I will say I would chair to, um, I chaired an advisory group for the National Cancer Institute, as Carla mentioned. I'm a three-time cancer survivor. Um, and I am not a professional chair of advisory groups, but I seem to be part of a lot of them um, because I find them, I find the bringing together of these multiple perspectives so important. And so, um, and, and it is the cliched sum as much more, uh, the whole is much more than the greater, the great, 
or of the sum of its parts. So this group is really uncommon because it is not disease focused. It's really community focused. And there are many advocacy groups that provide um, input to the NIH in various different ways. But in many ways, they a lot of them perpetuate what we used to call when I was working a lot in breast cancer, the disease wards, breast cancer and HIV being one of the what one of the examples of that. And this is a very different shift in a traditional frame. The other thing that we do is we ask people to um, represent and talk to their communities, but also go back to their communities and talk about things that we have talked about within the group that other communities are thinking about. So when I did, when we had our first meeting, when we changed from a ad hoc working group to a um, ad hoc partnership to a working group, um, I likened the change to a, um, I, I used a musical metaphor. So my favorite music is jazz. And in jazz, and before that we were a bunch of soloists, but in jazz, everybody plays, they play together, they go apart, they improvise, but in the end, they all come together. And we all represent different things, and we all have different tunes that we carry, but we come back together, and then we go back out again. Um, and so our group, I think, is very unique in terms of building this kind of trust and open and honest relationship where we can talk about very difficult issues in a very open way, bring them into the group, and then bring them back out again. Um, this lens also gives us the opportunity to really be timely and to be responsive um, and to be very, very agile. So we build bridges across the institute. We also have bridges across other institutes. And I wanted to, before I went on, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about the genesis of our group and the genesis of what we did. Um, as we mentioned, our group came out, it was um, prior to becoming the Community Engagement and Genomics Working Group. Several members of our group were part of a more ad hoc, ad hoc group, the Partnership for Community Outreach and Engagement in Genomics. And the genesis of much of this came out of conversations with Vince Bonham when, um, when uh, the genome the genome exhibition was at the Smithsonian talking about how we could further engage communities and how we could bring patient advocacy into this, health advocacy into it, community engagement into it, and community leaders. And it started with a meeting that um, Vince and a number of us organized that was the ad hoc committee. So I wanted to say a special thank you to Vance Bottom, who, um, who was there at the genesis of this of this. Um, of this uh, working group and this kind of engagement, very new and unique engagement. I also want to say a special thank you to Laura Rodriguez. Laura has always been an incredible champion of our group. And I first met Laura when um, I was chairing the, now it's called the, well, it was called the Directors Consumers Liaison Group. I can't remember what it's called anymore, the National Cancer Institute. Um, and Laura, from the beginning that I met her, was um, was devoted to bringing community voices into these discussions. And then, of course, Carla Easter, who's the director of the branch, and Christina Dalton, who keeps um, who is our education specialist and keeps everybody going together. But this was a group that started and didn't know where we were going, but we started and we did some very specific projects. So, oh, I have to remember to do the slides. That's the other thing I always forget. Um, there we go. Okay. So we started out, we did a few project partnerships, and some of them started while we were an ad hoc committee, and some of them have, have continued into being a working group. The first ad hoc committee project we did was called Your Genome and You. Um, and that is a um, that is an infographic that we that the group developed together to talk about what genome was. We brought in a lot of um, comments. It took a long time to do, but it was something that was really in the end everybody in the in the working group felt very proud of and felt very much as if they could be part of. Um, the um, we many people were talking about really wanting very basic information and being able to have information that could be shared across communities, not just for one community or another. 
Um, we also recognized the need to work in partnerships with other groups. And so one of our members who was at the University of Washington um, came to us with an idea to look at collect with her colleagues at the University of Washington, collect a review of studies looking at the knowledge, attitudes, and perceptions of the public towards genetic counseling and testing. And a manuscript was drafted, and several members of the working group provided input. And then the final project that has actually just launched, and we are um, we are a member of um, is a project called the Health Experience Research Network, and um, it comes out of a project called DIPEX, which is at, at the it, that was started in Oxford, which is the database of individual patients' experiences. There are now over 142 um, 142 diseases. There are millions and millions of viewers, and what they do is they create modules that tell the stories within a qualitative research framework of experience with disease. So the second module in the US, our colleague who was actually in the first um, partnership, um, is the PI for at University of Wisconsin, is on genomic medicine, and it's focused on colorectal cancer, breast cancer, and Lynch syndrome. And so that just launched, and I am the, I'm a representative, I'm on the advisory group as a representative of the CEWG, CE, CEW, CEGWG, <laughs> CEGWG. Um, and that will be done probably in about two years, and they'll be, we're talking about how to, um, how to feature that on the NHGRI working, uh, our, our, the education branch um, and NHGRI website. Um, then the other thing that it w has been really important and people have come to us about is to have honest and direct feedback from diverse perspectives and really open feedback. So um, as more and more people know about our group, we've been we've been sought after for um, for input and from for diverse perspectives. Um, the many of these things have happened on an individual basis, but they are members of our group, and it's become more and more. Um, we've become more and more known. So we've been um, a number of us have been involved as individuals in um, in providing input into the All of Us Research Program, the Thousand Genomes Project, and just about every single member of the working group was at the Glee Group. Um, we provide a. Um, we provide a sounding board and a testing board, and we also provide a more a, a well-informed testing and sounding board. Because as we learn more about genomics in our group, our gr the people that we work with learn more about the communities that we represent and the communities that we um, that uh, to which we all speak. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we did was that we've also reviewed early drafts of the. Um, of feedback on the a series of videos called 42 North and public facing videos about genomics and those are on Genome TV. So one of the other very important things that we did is that we've been creating dialogue and intersections with a lot of other projects and a lot of, a lot of other places where we've elevated genomics into conversations where many of us are um, are out in the community, and there were not conversations about genomics and genomic medicine. So, for example, Carla Easter came and talked to two workshops that my organization, the National Patient Advocate Foundation, did on skilled communication with patients and care patients, caregivers, and healthcare providers. One at the uh, Mayhuck Mountain Area Health Education Center in Asheville, and one at the University of Illinois Illinois Cancer Center. And I will say, because I shared the um, evaluation with Carla, that at the University of Chicago, where we did the first real evaluation. It was one of the highlights of that, um, of that workshop, with primarily, primarily cancer patients in that workshop. Um, the um, four NHGRI staff members were invited by a working group member from the Crow Nation to have a community meeting at the Tribes Tribal College, and there's lots of work that's, that's coming out of that. Um, the Genetic Alliance asked us to, the working group's feedback on the early drafts of their epigenomic infographic and draft guide to community partnerships and needs assessment. Um, one of our members just provided an introduction to the Morehouse College of Medicine, a strategic planning event. Um, and one of our working group members was a featured speaker for NHGRI's history program series, and he spoke about historical trauma and its effect on Native groups, um, Native youth. Um, so I think one of the things that's really important about this, and I think it's been, um, it has been a 
um, implicit, but I want to make sure that it's very ex explicit, is that one of the, the power of our group is that it's bi-directional, that these conversations are bi-directional. We learn from the NHGRI, the NHGRI uses for, for, learns from us, and I actually wouldn't even say bi-directional, I would say multi-directional, because we have all learned from each other in the working group, and we have spent a lot of time and a lot of intentional energy creating a space where we can talk about some very, very difficult things like structural racism, like historical trauma, um, like uh, sexual orientation and what that means in terms of genomics, um, issues that are specific um, to one group um, that other groups may not necessarily understand. And we've looked, we've, we've approached it all with incredible, I, I would say, a lot of openness, a lot of heart, and a lot of willingness to listen to very divergent points of view. Um, so one of the things that we realized was that we needed to do, we had been, we had been working together for about a year, and we decided that we were faced with a lot of questions about genomics and healthcare. There are a lot of questions about um, about equity in genomics in healthcare, there are a lot of questions about what it is. There's a lot. Of, there are a lot of questions about what is the real promise of genomics in healthcare and what is the promise that is more exceptional in terms of genomics. So we did a survey to our group. About three quarters of our group answered the survey as the basis for some of the work that we're going to do. Um, is work we're going to do as we go forward. And so we really can't serve our communities or the NHGRI unless we know what their experience are, experiences are with genomics, healthcare providers, and what, what kind of, what they need or what they're interested in, in receiving. Um, and so these are some of the these are some of the quotes that sort of rose to the top from this survey. And I will say it was a survey monkey sur survey. It was not. It was a market research survey. It was not a um, rigorous uh, rigorous um, research survey. But it, it but it was a hypo It could be a hypothesis generating survey. So there's little awareness about genomics and lots of misconceptions. We all know that. But it's also important to have that reinforced and continue to be reinforced because if we don't address the misconceptions, we're not going to we're gonna, not going to move forward. Um, there are very limited resources for genetic testing or counseling in our community, and we see that everywhere. Actually, the P Patient Advocate Foundation, which is my other organization, I work I I span the two organizations. We have a genomic and genetic testing um, care line to help people access genomic testing as well as access care once they've been prescribed. Um, a treatment course based on genetic testing for which they have barriers to getting that, usually insurance um, denials. Um, I think that every every cancer patient, so we have a lot, we have, you know, clearly cancer is, rises to the top when we think of that, should know about their potential risk and whether they should or should not be tested. We've talked about that a lot. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting is the idea that this has to be very solution oriented. So any engagement that just focuses on understanding the disease or drug discovery or diagnosis is effective, but general education is of less interest. Um, there has to be something. There has to be something actionable that people can do with it. Um, of course, community educators are key and people who are trusted by the community. Um, but it was re we, we know that, but it's important to be it's important for that to be reinforced and that there are key tools to deploying into the community with information about genetics. And that's part of what we do with our working group, is that we try to help enable people to go into their communities and teach other people to go out beyond their communities. And the, um, and the dissemination of culturally relevant information on the influence of genetics and environment on chronic diseases affecting our population. And so people talked a lot about what was important to them and what was important to their different populations. What was important to American Indian populations might be different and the approach might be different than what was important to, to African American populations or Latino populations or Muslim populations. Um, so then the other thing that was critically important when we did this was identifying barriers or concerns and what we can do with some of these barriers and concerns. And one of the things that came out very strongly and very movingly to us particular um, was that 
this quote um, from one of our working group members, many LGBTQ people are very concerned about genomics. The recent news regarding the federal government's proposed definition of sex as immutable and based solely on chromosomes, many trans transgender people think of genomics genetics as a tool of an enemy. And I think that we have to, we, we know that there are communities who, consider, who think of genomics as the tool of the enemy, but I think that we don't always know every community that, that, thinks, about, that uh, thinks about genomics in this way. Um, I think the other thing that, of course, happens often in these groups, especially when you're trying to be represented, I mean, larger groups that are trying to be representative, is that we can be a little reductionist in our thinking. And so one of our Latino members reminded us that Latinos as a group are not homogenous in their beliefs, um, thinking, culture, or history, and that there's some resistance among some, particularly those with indigenous beliefs about sharing their spirit. Um, so these are the kinds of things that within our group we were really surfacing and we were really surfacing in places where we could have honest and safe talks. It's a, our group is a, is a um, not to use a cliche, but is a very safe space where we can really focus on what to, on, on people feel comfortable enough to talk in a, with people of very different values, beliefs, um, than they do because they feel like they will not, that they will be heard and that people will take what they've heard back and integrate that into their learning. Um, so then we talked about collaborating to find what works, follow the lead of the communities themselves who have already been working to improve the patient experience, fund research on patient engagement and satisfaction in the clinical encounter. Um, that's a lot of what work. That's a lot of what a lot of us are doing in other places. Um, I work a lot with PCORI, for example. Um, needs assessments, tools to collect patients' feedback, and that's what we started with the University of Washington project. Um, help bring communities and healthcare providers together in a discussion about genomics and health that provides a safe space for everyone to raise questions. And as I mentioned before, Carla came and spoke at two of our workshops and was um, and was very and and had I think a really terrific, very deep discussion with a lot of our participants. Um, I know we say this about every topic, I'm reading a quote, but bringing in, bringing genomics in early and often into the schools at every level will help it to diffuse into communities. Um, I truly believe the more we have local community-based individuals working to provide the day-to-day -day outreach, education, resources, and with all the available materials, we would impact more on the genomics health research. We could meet with our local, tribal, and state representatives in expanding the goals of the NHGRI. And we have quite a number of representatives from the American Indian population, which, as we know, has um, significant um, historical trauma around genomics and significant um, concerns around genomics. So our goal is to provide NHGRI with better understanding about the challenges of challenges to an acceptance of genomic resources, research, and also to the uptake of genomic applications. And as I said in the beginning, our group should be a group that is used to both go at, both understand what's going on. Um, externally and within our group, but also to use as a group that can speak out into the communities as we all have been doing. Um, we are um, we are committed to equity. We are committed to equitable access. We're committed. There was a lot of talk about um, equitable access and representation on in a lot of research studies. We are committed to that, and then we are also committed to making sure that the fruits of genomic research and genomic medicine are available to all. And I will say that um, I, I think we've gotten we've we've moved quite far um, with our committee, our, sm our it's actually not so small anymore, but our mighty committee um, in, and have created a really pr pretty extraordinary dialogue within that community. And I think we've gone a long way. I'll end with a personal anecdote. My dad is a retired physician. He had a, he had got a master's in genetics in the late 50s, maybe early 60s, right at the beginning. And so um, I, I knew we needed more education in genomics when my sister Suzanne said, um, Dad, now I get genetics. We have three brown eyes and three one, eye, front, one, one um, of my siblings has blue eyes. She said, it's, I understand Mendelssohn's peas.
So I think we've gotten beyond Mendelssohn's P's. We are creating a stronger understanding, and I hope that we're bringing back some understanding into the NHGRI. And we are um, grateful for this opportunity to be a working group. And thank you to everybody. And I'm happy to take any questions. OK. Well, thank you very much. All right. So uh, let's boost those caffeine receptors and take a break for uh, 15 minutes. Please be back at 3.20, OK?